，谢谢大家中场的交流。我们接下来要来听听 Garena 的故事啊 ，Group President of Garena, Mr. Nick Nash. Thank you all for being here today, and thank you for such a warm welcome. It's it's very nice to be here, and Taipei is one of my absolute favorite cities in the world. I was telling one of your colleagues、uh, just earlier, growing up in the United States, all through my life, my best friends growing up were Taiwanese.、Uh, when I was 12 years old, my best friend was Taiwanese. When I was at Harvard as a senior, my roommate was Taiwanese and head of the Taiwanese Students Association. And as I was joking, our room in Boston. Wasn't just a dorm room; it became the unofficial Taiwan embassy in Boston. <laughs> so I've,、uh, I have a tremendous love and fondness for this wonderful, wonderful country. What I'd love to share with you today is a little bit of our journey, a little bit of what we've learned over the past seven or eight years, building a technology business, building an entrepreneurial company here in what we call Greater Southeast Asia. And as I understand it, and I think this is a very wise decision. The government and the people of Taiwan are increasingly looking to the south, looking to the south for expansion, for cultural connectivity, commercial connectivity, and we feel very much the same way as a Singapore-based company. We've always thought that Taiwan is our brother and sister. In fact, Taiwan, we love to say within Garena, is like five Singapores, also an island, but much bigger in population, much bigger in land, and much that we can learn from and share with each other. So as I go through this journey. I want to really share with you how important Taiwan has been as well for our business, and I'll just start by a quick chart over here. We're approaching almost 500 colleagues now here in Taiwan. It's just under 500, and to see the team that we've built, full of local educated, locally trained Taiwanese to build a great business, makes me very, very proud. And that's been an important part of our journey. That as much as we have people across all of Southeast Asia. The important part is that each of our local country heads is local. It's from that country. Each of our top people in the country is from that country. We hire from as best we can, the best universities, and we provide career opportunities for people to build things on a local basis. And in many ways, we find ourselves inspired a little bit less by some of the U.S. tech companies and more inspired by companies like Unilever and Procter and Gamble that have built very special global businesses, but with deeply local management teams and local understanding. And I think, as we think about why that's important, the most important thing in the next five to ten years is that the ecosystem of internet in Asia will reach completion. There's already a tremendous ecosystem in North Asia that began with Japan and Korea and is now reaching full prominence in China. There's a developing ecosystem in South Asia and the Middle East that's closely united together. But Southeast Asia and Taiwan. Has always been the last part of the puzzle to be completed, and we feel very strongly that over the next five or six years, not only will it be the fastest-growing part of the internet in Southeast Asia and Asia more broadly, but it will have almost 500 million users in just four or five years. That's an enormous amount of growth and an enormous potential for all of us in this room to work together to create opportunities, careers, and to build shareholder value. And as we think about the different parts of what makes this exciting. Part of it is certainly population, and as you'll see from this chart on the left over here, there's certainly many, many countries in our region. As you look south, that have over not just 100 million people, but in the case of Indonesia, over 200 million people. That's a tremendous opportunity, and making that more addressable and economically interesting is the fact that most of these countries are leapfrogging not just telephony to smartphones, but they're leapfrogging traditional broadband, wired broadband. To mobile broadband. In fact, there will be many, many people in these countries that experience 4G as the very first broadband connection they ever have, well before a PC dial-up or an ISDN line or a DSL line. In fact, I think some of the countries in Southeast Asia will be some of the real test beds for 5G over the next several years to provide very rich services. And this creates a tremendous opportunity for all of us to address these needs. The way we've thought about building our business is to bring three related platforms together. Under one roof, and we were inspired by what we saw in other countries. For example, in the U.S., you think about the country, the companies that have been most successful over the last several years. Many of them have played in digital media. Many of them have played in e-commerce, like Amazon. Many of them have played in payments, like PayPal. That's true in places like China. It's true in places like India, even parts of Latin America. And as we picked the three spots we wanted to be most focused on. Clearly, part of that was going to be digital content, an extremely exciting area, something that the internet really makes possible, including esports. 
part of that had to be e-commerce, and I'll tell you more about how we thought about that specifically. And then as a golden thread that links those two very important use cases together, we felt that payments and financial services more broadly was an important part of what we wanted to bring together to our users. And the culture of the company as we've built the business side has been very much oriented towards engaging with communities. And I'll show you some pictures in a few moments, beginning with this page, and what that means for us. A very, very big part of it is l deep local engagement with universities. We do an 18-week training and skills program here in Taiwan. In Singapore, we've become, we think, one of the top two or three employers out of the National University of Singapore, really only after the government and some of the government businesses. And we do a ton of work around local employee and local community engagement, which we don't think is just kind of like a PR or CSR thing. It's part of what makes us excited to come to work every day. Increasingly, I think work and a sense of personal mission are being meshed together. People want to work for a company where they feel they can do something broader than just build a product or make some revenue. They want to make this part of their life, and that's a big part of why I work at Carino. If I give you just a simple visual of what we do across Southeast Asia, I started with the business logic. We're in content, we're in e-commerce, and we're in payments. But sometimes it's helpful to actually show to you what it looks like from space, as the bird would see it. And as you look at this chart over here, you'll see that we've tried to build our businesses everywhere where there are human beings in what we call greater Southeast Asia, ASEAN plus Taiwan. And I think what's very important about this chart is that a lot of people in Southeast Asia live in smaller villages and cities. If all we did was cover Bangkok and Taipei and Ho Chi Minh City and Jakarta, that would be a small fraction of the total addressable population. And especially with mobile, you can actually bring people online and bring them into your ecosystem in a very decentralized rural way. And I'll come back to how we've done this, but a big part of it is actually having people on the street, literally feet on the street, to go city by city, village by village, teaching people, explaining people how to become a part of this, this transition. So I'll spend maybe just a few minutes each on the three different pieces, more really by way of introduction. And really, I mean, we, we have so much to learn from all of you in this room, so take this less as kind of a sharing of any wisdom we have and more really just a sharing of the learnings and the observations and all the mistakes that we've made as we've gotten from where we began seven years ago to where we are today. I'll start with digital content, and I think Taiwan is a really fun place to be to talk about digital content because Taiwan, I think, is almost 10 years ahead or five years ahead of much of the rest of the world, especially around eSports. In fact, I'll show you a picture momentarily when President Kai actually sent off the Taiwan national team, which was going off into battle to eSports tournament. It's such a recognized and a special part of what makes Taiwan an important market globally in eSports. But there's a deeper truth here, which is that the nature of media is changing. I love to say that every generation has its defining media. Our grandparents remembered the first radio that they had in their house. My parents remember the first time they had a record player in their home in their first color TV. I remember accessing the internet for the very first time in 1994. But today's generation, the media that best describes how exciting the world has become really is interactive games. And we love to say that I think our grandchildren will look back and say that games are just multiplayer movies and movies are just zero player games. It, the only difference between the two is that they're both forms of storytelling, but one is more active and one is more passive. And as many of you in this room know, not only has it become a storytelling medium, games have become a medium for sport and for constructive collaboration and engagement across all ages. And this has become a very big deal, not just in the US and in Korea, but certainly in Taiwan. Here's an example of a recent picture from our esports events in Bangkok. We do an event every year in Bangkok called Garena Star League, which has 120,000 people. And our similar event we do in Taiwan has over 120,000 people as well. And what's exciting for us is that there's entirely new sports that are being created. Most of the sports that we think about every day, whether it's football or hockey or basketball, most of these sports were created about, about 150 years ago, many by the Americans and the British. We're creating brand new sports again right now. We're going back to that wonderful moment in human history where we're creating new culture, and esports is a big part of that. And naturally, part of that has an extension to the existing world of sport in the offline environment. One of our most popular games, not actually in Taiwan, because as you know, Taiwan is less of a soccer nation and more of a basketball nation, but one of our most popular games in places like Indonesia and Vietnam and Thailand is FIFA. 
And interestingly, people don't just want to play with those great players from Argentina or Brazil. This particular guy is one of the top Thai footballers, and people really want to be able to play as this character in the game and play matches against each other from Bangkok to Chiang Mai or from Pattaya to Chiang Rai. It's a very important part of national bonding and cohesion. And the inevitable evolution of esports, certainly, if I go back two pages, it certainly began on PC, but you can imagine where it will go. There's clearly a future now in mobile. And if I just take a little bit of an inset view on this situation, this is one of our very first mobile esports tournaments, in fact, one of the first in the world that's taken place. This was a four country tournament between Taiwan, between Philippines, between China, and Thailand. And as I recall, I think it was the Taiwan team that won. So it was a fantastic outcome for Team Taiwan on a mobile game, a two against two mobile game with thousands of people in the audience watching and rooting for all the different nations all coming together. Now from a business standpoint, there's certainly a cultural aspect that's important, but from a business person standpoint, what gets us very excited about this is that in China today, roughly one out of every two citizens plays games. Male and female, young and old, city and countryside. It's almost as natural as watching a movie or watching football on TV. And in Southeast Asia, it's still not quite as advanced as that. I think in the next seven or eight years, we think we can go from about 15% of the population playing games to about 50% of the population. And it's rare in life to have a situation where, just based on the observations and learnings from other parts of the world, we can pretty predictably see a tripling of demand over a short period of time. And that's exactly the situation we find ourselves in. So we're quite excited about that. And that leads us to what we've tried to accomplish in our business. The, the interesting thing about the game industry is that it's actually not that different from other parts of the media business. I'll give you the movie industry as an example. At the end of the day, we love our movie stars and we love great feature films, but actually being in the movie production business is a tough business. There's hits and there's misses, there's ups and there's downs. And then, of course, being a movie studio, that's a slightly better business to be in because you might have 20 different projects each year, and again, you get to have a bit of a portfolio, but even that's not a really exciting business. The really great business to be in is to be Netflix, where you become the portal, where all the world's best content wants to come to your store, and there's a similar analogy I could give you for music with iTunes, and a similar analogy I could give you for books with Amazon, and the game industry is very sim similar in that there's a portal dynamic and an app store dynamic that's a very powerful framework, and it's doubly special for games because in the book industry, most people don't read books with each other. You don't have someone flipping the page alongside you, but in the game industry, you're playing games with each other, so there's a virality, and there's a concept of network effects, which makes platforms a very important part of the ecosystem. So we're very proud to be the largest game platform for, again, greater Southeast Asia, for Taiwan and the ASEAN nations, and to really bring teams together, players together from this entire region to have a lot of fun together and to have this sporting activity all, all under one roof. And a very important part of this business, by the way, is similar to other businesses around the world. We've managed to link this concept of esports to the concept of chat. And we can spend more time talking about that maybe in the Q&A, but chat as a central feature, as a use case, turns out to be a pretty important part of our business across everything we do. And here in Taiwan, I think we just, we feel so honored and we feel so grateful to be a player and an important presence in this country. At the very highest levels of the government, there's an appreciation for esports and really impressive that President Kai took the time about two weeks ago to really spend time with the Thai, with, with, excuse me, with the Vietnamese, uh, with, with the Taiwanese team that was going off to a very important tournament to wish them well on that tournament, just as if someone was going off to the Olympics. So we feel that there's a recognition and understanding in Taiwan that is many years ahead and a very, very special thing. And more broadly, we're trying to make investments here to help the ecosystem. We've built a pretty big stadium for esports, dedicated to esports here in Taiwan, and we host about 300 tournaments a year, almost one a day, which is a very special thing. And then lastly, we run an event here as a part of our Garena Esports League, which has an enormous number of people coming, over 100,000 people a year. And in the most recent tournament we did, we had 1.6 million viewers streaming into it, which is a very large part of the population. This is becoming almost as exciting as the NBA would be in the US or, or FIFA would be in Europe. So I'll just pause there and shift over to e-commerce. And e-commerce is one of those really interesting industries that at some level has been around forever. Frankly, ever since Amazon and eBay back in 1994, 22 years ago, people have been trying to sell things online. And the way we think about it is that there's an enormous transition underway. Retail and consumer spending is changing. And this 
This chart tries to give you our very best thinking as to how large an opportunity this could be. And just to be very precise about definitions, we've taken out games, we've taken out movies and audio, we've taken out plane tickets and hotel rooms. This is just buying things. This is actually buying stuff online, traditional e-commerce. And we think that today, Taiwan is clearly the largest e-commerce market in all of greater Southeast Asia, and over time will remain one of the most important markets. In fact, the only market that will probably be bigger than Taiwan over time is Indonesia with its 200 and almost 60 million people in the country. But it just goes to show what an enormous opportunity for growth we feel there will be across all the nations together. And buried inside of this page, and part of each of these columns, is the cross-border opportunity. Taiwan has one of the most vibrant and value-added manufacturing sectors in the world, whether it's for consumer goods, electronics, fashion, you name it. And a lot of that will be exported from Taiwan to the rest of Southeast Asia uh, because of the quality and the brand and the reliability of the goods. So there's an enormous export opportunity for Taiwan here. In many ways, the next step of Taiwan's balance of trade journey as it grows as an economy. But at the end of the day, you know, again, e-commerce is, as I said, a 22-year-old industry. And there's a lot that we can learn from what has worked and especially what has not worked over the last 22 years. And I'll start by saying that many of the traditional definitions or taxonomies or classifications of e-commerce, we feel are starting to become less and less useful. For example, everybody's heard of B2B e-commerce, B2C e-commerce, C2C, P2P. There's even this new variation, B2B2C. And a lot of these things, I think, personally as a business person, confuse rather than enhance the conversation. So let me share with you how we think about e-commerce. And again, we're, we're still new at this, so we'd love your feedback. But as business people, we think that there are two very fundamental and practical decisions you have to make. The first decision is, are you going to be asset light or are you going to be asset heavy? And there's a lot of different ways to be asset heavy. You could have inventory that you have on your balance sheet. You could have warehouses. You could have even logistics and delivery infrastructure. Amazon is even thinking about buying planes to deliver things. That's a very specific decision you have to make, light versus heavy on your balance sheet. And the second decision is a little bit more subtle, and we got a lot of learnings on this from one of our shareholders that's been very instructive in helping us think this through. There's a fundamental distinction between CCC and non-CCC e-commerce. What I mean by this is CCC, the three Cs, is consumer electronics, computers, cell phones, and cameras. It's been an enormous source of prosperity for Taiwan to be one of the global manufacturing hubs for those category of goods. And in fact, it's much to Taiwan's benefit to be the manufacturer of those goods. The retailers of those goods don't make that much money. And in very practical business people terms, the typical gross margin for CCC is somewhere between 3 and 6%. And the contribution margin, which is your gross margin minus your variable costs, can often be negative. So if you're focused on asset-intensive e-commerce and triple C, it can often be a more challenging business model than if you're purely asset light and non-CC. Now, now, you might ask, well, what's non-CC? What does that mean? It's all the stuff you're wearing. It's all the stuff in your living room. It's all the stuff on your feet. It's all the perfumes and cosmetics. It's all the baby toys. It's all the little tiny things that are broader consumer spending. And on average, some are higher, some are lower, those tend to be 30 to 40% gross margin, and I would say 25 to 35% contribution margin. That's where the real money in retail is. So in terms of the economic opportunity, we are puzzled and surprised that so many people in e-commerce have gone after this. And the list is a long one of companies that have gone after electronics intensive businesses with lots and lots of inventory. And for better or for worse, these businesses often have very structurally challenged economics. But interestingly, if I just look at where money has been made consistently in the upper right, something like two-thirds of Alibaba's value from China comes from that quadrant. A big part of eBay's market capitalization of 35 billion comes from that quadrant. And our hunch is that in general, there will be a six or seven to one ratio between the shareholder value created in the upper right and the value created in the lower left. So if you had a choice, you'd probably want to focus there. And based on the learnings and the wisdom that the industry has generated over the past 22 years, we elected to go down that path. And that led us to the business of Shopee today. And I'm very proud to tell you that Taiwan is one of the most important parts of Shopee. Taiwan has been a test bed. And really, in many ways, like we say in America, Taiwan's been the California. It's been where new innovative ideas happen first and grow extremely quickly. 
And Choppy today, in aggregate, with a tremendous contribution from Taiwan, is already at 1.5 billion US dollars of throughput. And we've accomplished that in just 15 months. And I think when we show you what that means in practice, many of you in this room have children, and you know those, those charts that the pediatrician has that says, how much does your baby grow in the first three months, six months, nine months, and so on? Well, we can do something similar for e-commerce companies. And I'll just show you a couple examples. So some of you may have heard of a company called Mercado Libre. It's kind of like the Taobao of Latin America. And there aren't that many of these businesses that are publicly traded that have information, so we wanted to give you a global perspective. In its second year, Mercado Libre did $21 million of GMV. It was a few years back, but it was still, you know, it had all of Latin America. Uh, eBay, in its second year, did $95 million of GMV. Uh, Lazada, which is a, a terrific business that we're, you know, certainly quite close to and we have a lot of respect for, they did about $95 million in their second year. Alibaba had all of China, a billion people, 150 in year two. Lazada grew to almost 400 in its third calendar year. Amazon, a company that we deeply respect, did about 600 million or so in its fifth year, and that's revenue. So if you adjust it for GMV, call it 700 or so of GMV. Here's Shopee right now. It's just been 15 months. It's not even hit its second birthday yet, and we're just very proud of how much support there has been from sellers, from customers, from the community, to really create something so special for all of greater Southeast Asia, anchored around Singapore, Taiwan, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and many other countries. This is really special. This is the fastest growing e-commerce business in history, to our knowledge, and Taiwan has played a central role in its development and in its execution. And to show you how we did this, I think it's helpful to maybe give you a little bit of flavor for how it's different. All of you in this room have certainly driven a car, or been in a car before, and many car manufacturers will have the same engine but a different exterior in different parts of the world. And we've thought about that in a similar sort of way for Shopee. So for example, here's what Shopee looks like in Taiwan. Here's what it looks like in Singapore. And as you go country by country, you'll see that not only is the language a little different, but even this, the mix of goods, the way they're marketed, the color schemes, the logistics, the payments, they're all very unique to each country. But the engine underneath the hood, which was perfected here from our first major launch in Taiwan, has been shared across all of Southeast Asia. And truth be told, this seems to work very well in other parts of the world that are fragmented. Uh, you're lucky to be in China or Germany or the UK or America to have literally a multi-trillion dollar GDP pool to go after. But I think actually in many ways the real challenges and the interesting open space for the internet in the next 10 years are the more fragmented parts of the world. The Southeast Asia and Taiwan, the Middle East, parts of Africa, parts of Latin America. And in these markets, the real challenge is stitching together multiple economies with very special local cultures, traditions, political institutions, currencies, even different levels of affluence, but bringing them all together. And consistently around the world, we see that this happens. Typically, there's one or two key anchor countries, like a Taiwan in the case of Southeast Asia, a Poland in the part of Eastern Europe, a Turkey in the part of the Middle East. But around that, you form something very special that gets to create a trading block in the platform itself. And I wanted to share with you what this actually looks like in practice. From left to right, you're seeing the passage of time. The top part of this page is sellers on Shopee, and the bottom part of the page is buyers on Shopee. And as you'd expect, there's often a few more buyers than there are sellers. And we began with a core of sellers in the top two or three cities in Taiwan, and it's, it's been so gratifying, it's been so special to see this really, really deepen over the course of the last 15 months to the point now where almost every single little tiny village has, or town, has a Shopee buyer and a Shopee seller, and often, often more than that. Uh, a big part of this as well has been figuring out ways to engage with the local entrepreneurial community. And if I just go back a couple pages, I want to share something very practical with you guys. If you go back to this framework for how e-commerce businesses get built, one of the biggest distinctions between being asset heavy and asset light is your interaction and engagement with sellers on the platform. When you're asset light, by definition, you're in business to help other sellers make money. Your entire revenue model, your entire economic well-being comes from making other people money. Whereas when you're asset heavy, it's a perfectly good business model, but oftentimes your bigger focus is trying to predict and guess what customers want to buy. You go source that wholesale and you sell it retail. It's a different philosophy. In our case, we've been very asset light, so the whole part of our strategy has been to find great sellers in each of these countries to give them a chance to make a significantly bigger livelihood. 
And in just our 9-9 event a few weeks back, we had 10,000 sellers join. And today, across all of Shopee, we've got about 1.5 million sellers on the platform. And there's a bit of an 80-20 rule about you know, some fraction are responsible for a disproportionate amount of, of the GMV, but they're creating really significant livelihoods as sellers on the platform. And Taiwan is a great example of how that's being done. Today, we're doing about 10, excuse me, 100,000 transactions daily in Taiwan, and I would love to see that grow by five or six X in the coming, coming months and years. Uh, Indonesia has been a big part of our business, and I think as Taiwan looks to the south, this is a country that many people in this room will visit, will study, will get to know, will build relationships in, and we would love to be a part of that process for you to help share what we've learned about this wonderful country. Thailand's been a big part of our business. Uh, Vietnam's been a big part of our business. And really, I think we're seeing a new awakening, a reawakening of the connectivity between all the countries uh, in, in, our, in our part of the world. And lastly, I'll just spend a moment on payments, then we can pause and open it up for, for questions. Uh, I think there's a fundamental problem in Southeast Asia outside of Singapore and Taiwan, which is that over the last 30 or 40 years, the previous generation has done a very poor job of creating financial access. Uh, partly I mean this from a CSR and from a community relations standpoint, but frankly, as a business person as well, I'm, I'm surprised by how poor a job in general, the banking industry has done of giving people access to very basic things like a checking account or savings account, let alone having a consumer credit card. I'll just give you one data point. In Vietnam, not far from here, about 100 million people, but only 70, sorry, only 29% of the adults have a bank account. 71% are literally stuffing dollars or dong in their case into little glass bottles in their garden or under their mattress or in a safe in their home. It's a very inefficient way to operate and it limits your ability to transact online because the whole purpose of online commerce is digital payments, not cash payments. The same situation holds in the Philippines and in Indonesia and even in some of the more developed countries like Thailand, you still have about 20% of the adult population, which is a large chunk of people without a bank account. There has to be a way to solve this, number one, because it's the right thing to do, but number two, none of these customers are going to be practically addressable as entrepreneurs, uh, as customers of our businesses, unless they can access the payment system. What we've done is we've created something that we call AirPay, and we've been very quiet about the branding. We haven't done a big marketing push for this, but quietly this has grown to become the second largest fintech company in all of Southeast Asia. We're not yet in Taiwan, we're not yet in some other countries, but we are quite active in Indonesia, Thai, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam. And what AirPay has done in a very quiet, very humble way is to solve this pain point between cash and digital. Like we've even come up with kind of a fun phrase for it. We call it the reverse ATM, because most of you in this room, are, you know, all of you in this room have an ATM card in your wallet, you pop in the card and out comes some paper. What if the process went the other way around? What if you could pop in paper into the system and instantly it will be digitized or topped up. And instinctively, it's not that different than mobile top up. You give the little merchant some cash and you get a bunch of minutes on your phone if you're on a prepaid model. But imagine broadening that concept where instead of getting minutes, you're just getting new Taiwan dollars or you're getting dong or you're getting rupiah as the case may be. This has turned out to be the solution because inevitably it has to be a combination of physical offline presence and then digital back end. It's the real offline to online in our mind. This has become a very big business for us. In fact, just over the last few weeks, we've exceeded sort of the psychologically important half a billion dollar of throughput milestone. We're now processing on an annualized basis just a little bit more than half a billion US dollars through this AirPay system. And there are some people that are using the app and some people that are using the offline counters. But this is really democratizing payments for the rest of Southeast Asia. And I want to really emphasize this because all of you as entrepreneurs and business people in Taiwan have access to a very sophisticated set of financial products and tools, but as you build your businesses into places like Indonesia and the Philippines and Thailand and Vietnam and so on and so forth, you're gonna to have to adapt to the local circumstances and techniques like this have worked really well. And we'd love to be helpful if we can as you're building your business by giving you access to this network. And one, one way to sort of think about where this can go in the future is to think about linking e-commerce to this reverse ATM network. We did a kind of a fun study a little while ago. We used GPS coordinates, latitude and longitude, to map our AirPay locations, these physical reverse ATMs, with where our buyers and sellers are for Shopee. And I'll just give you the example of, of, of Thailand. It turns out that about 99% of our Shopee buyers are within a three kilometer walk 
of one of our air pay counters, about 80% are within one kilometer. Now, I'd love to get to the point where 99% are within half a kilometer. And as time goes by, I think we'll get closer and closer to that goal. But imagine if it's as easy as walking 500 meters, handing over cash, and your e-commerce transaction settles, even if you don't have a bank account or credit card. That's the aspiration that we have through the scale that we're building in our business. So if I sort of sum it all up together, you know, I think um, if, if I sort of go back to sort of basics and where sort of all this began, there was something wonderful that was created when Pierre Omidyar founded eBay back in 1993-94. He discovered that it was a different kind of network effect. The more buyers on eBay, the more sellers want to be in eBay. But the funny thing was the more sellers, the more kinds of things you could buy and that led to more buyers and it became a positive cycle, a positive circle that increased over time. And people today call these, formally they call them multi-sided platforms where each group on each side of the platform is beneficial to the other and they can dramatically improve their efficiency by unifying on a single platform. That's true in our game business as well, where the more gamers, the more wonderful game developers want to be on our platform to reach those gamers, kind of like Amazon for books. It's definitely true on Shopee. The more merchants on Shopee, the more buyers want to be there. In fact, the more buyers, the more cross-border merchants will activate, and it becomes a wonderful circle that rises. It's been the case for us in payments as well, where the more counter locations, the more wallet customers, the more wallet customers, the more use cases, the more use cases, well, that just goes right back and encourages more merchants to become counters. And each of these by themselves has that virtuous cycle. What's interesting in terms of how we've thought about the business is that each of these wheels turns each other as well. The more easy we make it to pay for things, the more fun it is for people to, to buy game credits. And the more easy we make it to pay for things, well, the more people want to join Shopee and be part of that ecosystem. So we think of it as two great use cases, commerce and content, that have a little bit of a golden thread that links them together, that just makes life easy for everybody, it makes life a little bit more comfortable, a little more convenient, and especially for sellers and buyers, improves their quality of life uh, as they go through every day. So I'll pause right there, and uh, if we have a little bit of time, we can chat a little bit. And again, I want to really emphasize, we're entrepreneurs like many of you in this room, we're learning every day. So if I can be helpful in questions you have, I'll do my best, but we may not have all the answers for you. We're, we're trying to be good students of this industry every day, just like all of you guys are. So with that, let me pause, and uh, happy to chat a little bit. Great, thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Uh,你讲的重点，我们待会再跟大家翻译。不过我们现在先把宝贵的时间留给你，跟大家交流一下。在座有没有哪一位宝贵这个机会跟你来互动一下？好，刚才你讲到了哦，好，呃，直接来，
Could you just repeat the first question? I want to make sure I answer it correctly for you. Okay, the first question is, before you run the new business, like um, gang campaign conference or e-commerce, I believe you do some competitive analysis. Uh, and would you please share your analysis result because there's so much income campaign EC around the world. I don't, I don't, I want to learn more about what do you think about you between you and Amazon or you uh, between others, players. There's the first question. Good. Second question is before you run the Shopee's and the Shopee revenue like 1.5 billion GMV is under your expansion or not? If yes, how you can make your dream come true? No, it's both wonderful questions. Thank you for asking them. Let me start with your second question first. Uh, I spent 10 years of my life as a technology investor at a wonderful firm called General Atlantic, and GA was an investor in Alibaba and E-Trade and Priceline and many other businesses. And in our experience, roughly 80 or 90 percent of the businesses we invested in didn't quite hit their projections. They may have turned into good investments, but revenue was maybe a little soft or profits were behind schedule, and that's okay, but you know, they still turned into good investments. Oftentimes, it's that one out of 10 company that doesn't just hit its plan, but it's a multiple of the plan originally. And just to be very transparent, when we first planned for Shopee, our rough sense, and this is maybe even our second or third budget, was in 2016, you know, we might do about 150 million of GMV. That was genuinely where we thought. In fact, when we were raising our last round of capital, we went and told people, expect about 150. Then it looked like it was doing a little better, so we raised that number to 400, and then we raised that number to 600. We're at 1.55 right now. So we're very pleased and honored and, and grat gratified that it's been about eight times faster than what our initial projections were. Not just 8% better, but literally 700% better than what we thought it would be. In terms of your first question, competitor analysis, I'll, I'll, I'll give you maybe two different versions of the answer. It's true, we did a lot of planning, we looked at other people in the market, we tried to study them very closely. How, what is their product, what is their service, what are their people, how do they really work it? But one of the great things about the internet and the, broadly speaking, the technology industry is that sometimes the best way to build a great business is not to look behind you or around you, but to look in front of you, to ask the Steve Jobs question, which is, well, it seems like everybody's building these sort of phones, but what if we did it better? What if we did it a little bit differently? By the way, it's hard to do this consistently right, but sometimes when you're driving a car, as much as you should look at the mirrors, you have to stay focused on what's in front of you. So in the case of Shopee, we did a lot of competitor analysis, but ultimately we thought about, on first principles, what would the customer love? What would be really convenient, really easy? What would just feel natural and organic to the customer, both the seller and the buyer? And when we put ourselves in the clothes and the shoes of the customer, a lot of things became very obvious, even if our competitors weren't doing them. And we tried to follow what, our hearts and our passion to make sure that the product would be something that the customer would love. Thank you so much, Mick. Now I have a chance to Do you have time for one more question? I have all the time in the world. Oh, wow, great. That's the T-shirt. Let's give this guy a hand. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Jim from KK Day. I've never had someone get applause for asking a question before. <laughs> yeah, it's been happening for the whole day. Yeah, um, actually, before I start my questions, I gotta say I'm a huge fanboy of Garena. I have been Thank one you. of your active members for almost a decade. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Can we uh, hire you? Uh, <laughs> well, my boss is right here, so uh, there it could be further discussed. Okay, we talk after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, my question is. Um, because you, as you mentioned earlier, like one of the great uh, secret behind Garena's success in regional expansion in Southeast Asia is highly related to um, local hire from top to bottom, from their executive officer to you know local staffs. Uh, my question is, how is it possible? Or like, what is the secret for Garena to extend the same core value and or extend the co uh, corporate culture to all these local uh, employees? And, uh, or is it, or is it the, uh, it's a strategy about like stage by stage. At the, at the beginning, you have people from the, the headquarter to kind of uh, help them with that. How do you extend that? And also, at the same time, how do you keep that flexibility for them to adjust to, uh, to the local culture, to the local uh, scenario? Yeah, thank you. It, it's a really important question. I, 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 I thank you for asking it because for everyone in this room that's built a great business in Taiwan and is starting to look south, your first question is, well, so how do I do that? 
you know, do I have to hire some Indonesian to run my Jakarta office? Do I have to go find a Filipino to run Manila? There's two things that we did, I think, that were very special, and you know, it turned out with the benefit of time to have been helpful to us. The first thing we did is we aligned on a set of values and behaviors that we felt were really important for the company. And let me be the first to say that most companies have like this mission statement or vision statement, and usually it's written by a PR agency. <laughs> you know, Enron had one of these things. I'm sure Sino Forest had one of these things as well. And the reality is that if you don't really stay true to it, if, if you don't have that compass for what's true north, it doesn't really mean anything. We spent a lot of time. We took the entire management team to Taiwan, actually, and built it on a retreat over here. We came up with five values that meant a lot to us. And what's important, and I'll go into detail because it's important to see how we constructed it, we didn't want nouns and we didn't want adjectives. And these are important things, actually, because a noun is anybody's judgment as to what it really means. An adjective is a squishy thing, but if it's a verb, it's a behavior. So we had five verbs that define what it means to be a Greenian internally. The first and most important one I shared with you earlier, it's we serve. We have to be customer service minded. We have to be civic minded in how we operate. The next one is we run, because it's an absolute crying shame that Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web 25 years ago, but still only one out of every three Indonesians uses it. All right, so we have to run a little faster. We have to adapt, we have to keep thinking about things and being adaptive means you're intellectually honest. We have to commit because oftentimes in Asia and Southeast Asia, people say one thing and do another. We have to commit, we have to be true to what we say and what we wanna do. And finally, the most important one is we stay humble. We have to understand what it's like to be a customer earning only $2,000 a year. Forget $2,000 a month. We have to understand what it's like to be a cyber cafe in the middle of the jungle in Borneo with a very poor internet connection. We have to know what it's like to be a customer with no bank account or credit card. We stay very humble. Those five things we used to hire people. Like when we hire people, we literally have an inventory. And we try to get a sense for how closely their life and their character matches to those. We use them when we're promoting people. We use them when we're evaluating people. Very, very important for us. That's part one. Part two is a little more subtle. We look for universities where people come from many, many different parts of the world all to study together for three or four years, and then we hire those out because when you're living in the dormitory, when you're in class together, and you're with people from different nationalities, it broadens your horizon. Now, you don't always have the good fortune to do that, but for example, there are universities in Taiwan that attract people from multiple parts of Asia. There's great universities in Singapore that attract people from all over Asia, even the West. And we look for people that have a little bit of that worldview, and we want to empower them to be successful. And one of the forms of diversity that we pay a lot of attention to, we certainly pay attention to gender diversity and cultural diversity, but we spend a lot of time thinking about intergenerational diversity. I would just make an argument here that in the US, the average age of a member for board of directors is somewhere around 60 years old. Average age, and some of these are tech companies. Whereas the average age of a senior executive at Garena, and often people that have a thousand people working for them, is somewhere between 28 and 35. Now, part of that's we're a young company, but part of it as well is we've learned that great generals often can be trained young. Alexander the Great was like 33 when he died. He'd conquered half the world. Uh, you think about some of the great business people in history like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates. They were in their late 20s by the time they'd already created billions of dollars of value. Many large companies don't give those folks a chance. I'm talking to your boss right now, by the way, not you. <laughs> and we ask ourselves a very simple question. If, God forbid, we gave Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia a magnetic access pass to our office and they could interview everybody in our company, who would they fund? Would they just pull people out of our company and give them $20 million? If they would do it, Damn it, we should do that, <laughs> and we should be empowering them internally. So there's a lot of intergenerational diversity, and to create great cultures, if someone's worked for 30 years in a different organization, you hire them laterally, they can add a lot of value, but often they're used to a different culture and environment. You hire somebody a year out of university in Taipei, and within three or four years, they're managing 400 people, you have a chance to make them part of your culture. Thank you so much, Nate. Your assistant just told me you're gonna miss your flight, so. <laughs> oh no, my flight's tomorrow, I'm good. <laughs> I'll be okay. I'll be okay. You good? But I don't want to keep you waiting. No, no, no problem at all. Oh, we'll have the last question, if there's any other questions. Okay. Okay. If there's no other questions, we'd like to thank Jamie, thank you very much for coming to this event. Jamie, you can say a few words. Okay. Let's take the microphone. So, uh, Nick, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming all the way. My pleasure. To Taipei, despite of the, the typhoon. And uh, you know that this is only our uh, first event, and we didn't even know it's going to be this turnout. 
when I, when I talk to you, I, I never promise you the turnout. So I, I, I'm very grateful. <laughs> I hope this turnout is satisfiable for, for you, and I, I hope I'm you deeply enjoy touched. the question. And uh, this, uh, this forum is going to be uh, here every year, so we hope that you can join us every year. Sure, sure. Ladies Thank and you. gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's uh, give a round of applause to Nick. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. 好，谢谢 Nick 刚才给我们再来一段非常精彩的对话。他刚刚才从机场来，他现在要回到机场去，所以纯粹来参加我们这论坛的哈。在他的分享中也谈到了今天 Garena 的三个。重要的 business， 第一个当然是大家所熟悉的 contents， 包括这些 gaming 哈，他用新的角度让我们思考 gaming， 他把 gaming 比喻成一个 sports， 他把 gaming 比喻成 movie， 这不只是说这些观众在玩游戏的时候就像看一场球赛一样啊，包括他们的生意模式都是仿照，比如说像呃电影的 Netflix 这样的平台，他认为。平台才是最好的生意啊！那第二个，他谈到了他们的电商策略，跟早上我们的 PC Home 和 Momo 产生了一个对比啊。他们强调他们是要做轻资产的事业，而且是不做任何 computer、cell phone 还有 camera 这些三 C 产品的哈。那这当然跟早上的 PC Home 跟 Momo 形成蛮大的区隔，因为他们。觉得自己轻资产，自己不做 B to C 才能全新的帮助他们的 seller 和 buyer 创造最美好的效应。好，这一点跟 PC 用不一样，大家可以互相去比较一下。最后，当然他们讲到他们的 AirPay， 那这个在台湾也许大家买东西开银行账户很方便，但事实上在越南、在泰国这个地方有百分之七十的人，二十五岁以上人都没有。银行的账户，所以这是一个非常大的商机。在对谈的时候，其实那个也谈到了要怎么样，呃，去维持员工的忠诚度，哈，呃，他说这些 mission statement 不要有太多的名词，不要太多的形容词，而是简单强而有力的动词。We serve， 他强调了要多元化人才，不只是在地理上的多元化，而且在世代中的多元化。所以希望你们公司的主管不再是六十岁的。中年人而是二十几岁的年轻人哦，他他有回答您的问题哈，少花一点时间看 competitors， 多花一点时间看你的 customer， 在这两个 C 之中就有很大的差别哈，所以我们谢谢你，还有所以 Garena 同事促成了今天的这场活动，哎，谢谢 Jamie。